Hi, I'm Chris Lee, and this is Virtually Speaking. Joining me today is Eric Wall. He is certainly one of the hottest speakers in the country and has been for the past decade plus. He's an internationally recognized artist who ignites the stage with his incredible paintings, messages, and energy. He's a best-selling author who wrote the New York Times number one bestseller, Unthink, Rediscover Your Creative Genius, which was named CEO Reed's Book of the Year. He created a 10,000 square foot Mona Lisa in a desert near LA. And the next year in 2012, he was selected as a speaker for TED 2012. His art is not for sale, but rather auctioned off at his events and his paintings have raised over $1.5 million for charities. Today, Eric and I talk about creativity, innovation, design, adapting, problem solving, risk, anxiety, and reigniting our passion for life and our passion for inspiring others. Join me with Eric Wall now. Well, hello, Eric Wall. Thank you for joining me here on Virtually Speaking. How the heck are you doing today? I'm doing well, Chris. Thanks for the opportunity to be here and to share with your valued customers and friends and family and speakers. I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I was really excited that uh, you could do it. And um, you've always been one of my absolute favorite speakers and thought leaders. You know, when I got into this business over a decade and a half ago, you were already one of the hottest speakers. <laughs> And you still are. You still, in fact, you're speaking more than ever. And uh, you've had two best-selling books since then. You're, you're world famous. It's, it's absolutely amazing what you've done. I was having breakfast this morning with my two four-year-old twin boys. And uh, they're painting. They have their own easels. And they're painting, like, all the time. Like, do you want to go on a bike ride? Yeah. What else do you want to do? I want to paint. Like, they want to paint. They love it. And they're painting, like, trees now. In fact, I got this... Uh, oh my God, I, this is this was my Father's Day gift. I've never gone off camera like this, but I have to show you now. These are my Father's oh. Day gifts. This is just <laughs> the other day they did that. Masterpieces. Those are brilliant. I love it. I can see their energy <laughs> right in their hands. That's fantastic, Chris. That's so cool. Thanks, man. Yeah, so... Uh, quick, quick, quick side note before we get into our stuff, but with your boys, one of the things that I recommend is to commission them. So... Tell your boys, hey, if you if you guys paint me a picture of what you want to be when you grow up, I'll take you out for ice cream. Or if you paint me a picture of how you feel about your mom, uh, you know, we'll go and take you to Chuck E. Cheese, or I'll take you on that bike ride. So that's one thing I've I've recommended to parents with their kids. You know, how do I encourage my kids? They're so creative, they're so fun. How do I that you act as almost their broker? Or you commission them to do artwork for you, and then give them. Uh, dad dates, father-son dates if, once they complete them. So have, have fun with those boys. That'll be a good activity for you guys. Yeah. And, and what is that? That instills a sense of entrepreneurialism that instills, you know, creativity on the spot, having to think on your toes. What it does is it rewards creativity because, you know, as they begin schooling, they're going to get letter grades for doing their spelling right or doing their writing right, how they read. They're going to be affirmed plenty for that. But it's that we really don't have a good system for affirming or measuring creativity or problem solving. So that's why I do it as a practice uh, for young kids to continue kind of working out those muscles in their mind. And for you as their dad, their kind of leader to help draw and facilitate it out. So all of that problem solving portion of their mind is aided through the uh, act of just simply drawing, painting, writing, all of those elements. So fun to do and encourage with your boys and then bring those ideas with you into into work. You're going to come up with some cool ideas yeah. when you're yourself kind of have those creative muscles flexing with your boys, Maybe paint with your boys. There's a lot of fun things that can, can be happening, especially when they're four. What a great age to be exploring. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. No, uh, that is incredible advice. I love that. That is, I'm going to do that for sure. Good. Uh, and, and they already just started learning the value of, of money, you know, and I, I did, I called it a bribe, you know, in my mind, because I was telling him to clean something up. And I was like, do you want to make a, you want to make five cents? And they're like, yeah, and I'm like five cents still means something. <laughs> so, anyway, so the art of vision. Okay. So the art of vision is really your, 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 your brand 
you know, uh, and, and then you've had your two books, which are Spark the Grind, the most recent one, and Unthink. Mm -hmm. so, so tell me, you know, this is amazing. I can ask the man this question. The art of vision, what does it mean? It's the act of seeing differently, to be able to, you know, kind of see what everyone else sees logically with their eyes, but to come to a different conclusion or different um, execution of ideas. And so the art of vision, you know, and I've, I've done a lot. I do painting, I do sculpting, I do photography. I also do a lot of writing. And so that's where these books have come from. Uh, my blogging that I've done. Uh, so my professional speaking that I do. So all of them are really vehicles or channels by which to get ideas out to the masses in different forms. Not everyone reads books anymore. That was popular, you know, back when we were young. So, you know, now I'm making videos. Not everyone you know, is able to attend a keynote speaking session for a lot of the private corporations or associations. And so I've figured out other ways to be able to get uh, information out and share it. Social media has just been an incredible form of being able to platform or share content distribution without needing to mitigate or barrier it off. So just all of these different vehicles and mediums by which to channel ideas and information now even interact with. So on social media, I can post up a, a piece of art and people can comment on it or we can talk about, you know, who are the great leaders we've experienced. There's just a lot of ways that um, because of technology, all of the arts have been activated in an entirely new way. So everything, it's been disruptive for some artists and speakers, but it's been very welcoming uh, to a whole new brand of artists and speakers who are embracing the, the augmented reality, the virtual reality, the virtually speaking. So there's a lot of cool things that I think we're on the, we're on the precipice of some really cool breakthroughs that are, are happening or about to happen uh, that are very exciting. Yeah, and that's that's something that you talk about a lot as a speaker is kind of these atrophy of skills that we've that we've had as a young kid mm -hmm. have 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 gone away, and and then we get away from being able to even believe in ourselves to create or innovate. And um, using creativity, you say as a lens, which I love. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, so so that's what you're talking about is basically you know people are in these situations where the world around us is changing and they're scared to change or they don't know how to innovate or change or disrupt with the changes. Well, and it is hard. If it was easy, everyone would be doing it, but there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, and let's just take specifically the, the global pandemic, right. where we kind of fast forwarded um, many, many years because we, were, we had to uh, reinvent ourselves. You know, desperation is the mother of invention. And so we had to figure out new ways to kind of operate our businesses. So it was forced disruption, created new ideas, new ways of communicating. And I think that's going to, you know, the forced disruption earlier created Airbnb, it created Uber, it created Instagram. It forces us to see things differently. Once we see things differently, we're able to operate from a new upgraded system uh, across all platforms. So there, there is great disruption. And that's why I don't fault people for being um, uh, anxious about the chaos that's going on, because it really is chaotic. And, and especially, especially right now, because we've got three diseases and, and kind of I define diseases as dis-ease. So we've got the global health pandemic, which is a disease, physical disease, health disease, challenging all of us to operate differently. We've got, um, economic dis-ease or disease with you know, trade situations with uh, China, other countries. Uh, we've got potential stock market bubbles, real estate bubbles. We've got some real uneasiness in the financial markets where we're uncertain that it's creating dis-ease in the future of what all of our platforms are gonna look like. And then we've got the, the dis-ease socially and politically where we've just got some friction that needs to be worked out. And it's not gonna be ironed out easily. In fact, come November 8th of this year, Half the country's going to be pissed. Regardless who wins, we're going to have tremendous friction that's going to continue. It's not going to all of a sudden dissolve once we have uh, a new leader or the same leader doing the old patterns. So th there's going to be you know, social and political disruption uh, and disease we're going to have to. So there, there's a perfect storm of diseases that we're working towards that we've got to still operate and run our businesses and look for ways to not just survive, but then I think angle off and to thrive, given that we know these are complicated issues, they're challenging issues, they're emotional issues for many of us. And so I'm, uh, I, I respect that everyone is un 
is anxious or uncertain at this time. And so I'm looking for ways that now that this is the backdrop, okay, now that we acknowledge this, we don't need to touch on it anymore. We can talk about what the potential in the future can look like going forward uh, and just affirm uh, people where we're at, where they're at and where they can ultimately go. And then getting back to your kids, getting back to how we raise our children, how we affirm our children, how we affirm our workforce, is we're starting to flex those creative muscles. And those are the muscles that had been, you used the word atrophy, and that's actually right, um, because our children migrate towards that which they're affirmed for, and they're affirmed for spelling and history. And But if you can affirm them for being creative, what that does is it gives us um, adaptation of the mind, the uh, mental agility or flexibility in our problem solving. So those artistic skills end up showing up when things get uncertain in the future, when, we're for, when we face a blank canvas in the future, and it, we, there's not color in by lines, we've got to figure things out for ourselves. And that's the dynamic intelligence that I think the art skills, uh, creative problem solving skills, the skills that entrepreneurs and businesses are going to be using is that adaptive vision to be able to adjust to the landscape and to think like people haven't thought before. So yes, it's an anxious time. And yes, it's created tremendous opportunity for those who are able to step into the uncertainty with confidence. So it, it's really game on for those of us who are who are ballers and want to be in the industry and making change happen for the future. Well, talk a little bit more about how you do that or how you think about it. I know you said something very interesting, uh, I think, uh, around, you know, that it, this, is, this is actually something you can learn. This is something you don't have to be born with is creativity and the ability to be innovative and think disruptively. So is this something you can teach people? It's a practice thing that you become better at, or is it something that um, you know, people can do these steps and all of a sudden yes. they'll be doing it the right way to fix these problems and innovate. So yes, it can be taught and yes, it takes time and practice to develop. And what, what it is, is it is a mindset. It is how we view the world. And a lot of times we view the world out of anxiety or out of uncertainty or even fear. So if we're able to name those things which cause us dis-ease or anxiety, it takes away some of their power yeah. and it moves us over. So in this COVID pandemic, we've all had a lot of time to ourselves, <laughs> more time than we've ever had to kind of work on our own issues, to, to look at what the future is going to be. And we still don't have a crystal ball for what this is going to look like down the road. In fact, the one thing I can almost assure people is it's going to look remarkably different than you actually thought it was going to. So just being able to be adaptive. And, and one of the ways that I kind of pull this all back to a state of, of consciousness, it's how we view the world. If we view the world very logically, very linearly, very um, algorithmically, then we see time lapse as a straight line. And it's difficult to think in, in a 365 degree view. However, if we understand that these are the rules, this is the gravity, this is the science for how we exist and how we know what we know, but we're able to get around that and to see outside the box, under the box, around the box, we start to see elements. And what we see is a place of abundance. So a lot of times, again, when we're thinking out of a place of linear thinking, when we think out of a place of or consumed with our own fears, anxieties, uncertainties, we're, our mind shuts down to its most uh, almost lizard brain reptilian reaction to what's going on around us. And it leaves us, in an, oper or an operating system of scarcity. Whereas when we step outside of that, even only for a moment, we, we start to experience uh, gratitude, which cannot coexist with fear. We start to experience um, different ideas, new ways to view some of these old patterns. And so we start to view the world from abundance. And so it's that simple operating system that we can make you know, right now. We can choose yeah. to see the world from a consciousness of abundance and expanded mindset, or we can continue to, oh, I'm so worried about what's gonna happen in the, in the markets. Uh, I'm worried about you know, who's gonna be the president. I'm worried about if I'm gonna get COVID. All certainly valid concerns, but when we allow those to be overly consuming our our mental agility tends to shrink to the point where it's just basically a speck on a board and we're a robot doing the things that we really cannot do to be able to differentiate from the competition, by which to be able to create unique value for our customers, create unique value as an employee. And you know, as we're talking about value, certainly technology, the increase in technology across the board um, 
really leaves us in a place where anything that can be automated will become automated. And that's not a, a large statement. That, that's not a, a hot take. It's we all know that everything that can be automated will be automated. So then what are, are we doing? What are you doing? What am I doing to make sure that we are indispensable? The, and value, the value add. The value add. In, in an increasingly automated world, how are you making your bureau value content through a trust and human connection? What am I doing as an artist and as a presenter to create value, mm -hmm. to create human value that my work, my message becomes irreplaceable? And so I think that's where, what are employees doing where they, be, they make themselves irreplaceable, that they can't be um, outsourced to automation or a machine or to a robot. And so for our children who are in school, teaching them those skills, you know, we need to learn to read, we need to learn to write, we need to do arithmetic. Yet beyond that, make yourself indispensable. Make what you do remarkable. Don't worry about being perfect, but be remarkable. And so for, for your kids, for my kids, for your employees, my employees, our clients, our customers, your customers, attendees, their audiences, you know, that very real connection to differentiate competitively, what is everyone in the room doing to make themselves irreplaceable, indispensable in a world that's becoming increasingly automated. So th those are some of the, the complex, heady issues that I love, but then yeah. attacking them with uh, you know, a lot of interaction, with a lot of humor, with a lot of um, colloquial stories. Certainly for me, I use speed painting and music and lights and sound to wake up senses, you know, more senses than just the head, because if you can drop an idea from someone's head or cerebrally thinking about something, down into their heart, where they're emotionally connected to it or it resonates with them. Uh, nostalgia is a very good way to do that. Humor is a very good way to do that. Uh, there's a lot of channels by which to be able to access people's head and heart at the same time and use, use those skills in combination with each other to unlock new thinking, to new potential. So that's um, one of the ways that I, the reason why I love performing so much is because you watch, um, you know, light bulbs come on in people's eyes as they, it's not because what I said was brilliant. It's because I unlocked something where I'm holding up a mirror and all of a sudden they see themselves as brilliant. And it's those ahas internally where they get excited for themselves. And, and that's what I, what I really enjoy is that I'm, I'm a messenger as a mirror, just showing the audience what they're really capable of when they expand their consciousness. And so, uh, one of, one of the reasons why I really love my job and I, I really, I enjoy live performance over, you know, I, I like it when people read my books. I like that they do the deep dive into the content and into the, uh, the material and the research and development, but the live performance, uh, there's really no substitute for, for live performance. Yeah. We're, we're watching bands on our, on our computer screen and watching concerts and it's good, but I think we're all also, waiting and longing for the day when we can hop back in the pit and be shoulder to shoulder with our brethren, you know, watching our favorite bands again and feeling those emotions. And so, you know, in the mean, in the meantime, we're looking for ways to, to virtually connect and, and not, you know, to remain relevant. But uh, I, I hope there is a way down the line that we're able to, uh, you know, make our live venues healthy and safe once again, because that energy, um, it, it, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, and I know a lot of your meeting planners' audiences are, are looking forward to it as well. But it, it's nice to have some, some placeholders as we're doing some WebEx, Zoom, Skype conferences. We're, we're all trying to figure this new chapter out until we, until we get back to live. We're going to be exploring a lot of cool new venues like this. Well, you know, the, the innovation that you were just talking about is going to be, you know, a, a very necessary and how everybody figures out how it's going to happen. And I think, it, you know, uh, everybody shares the same, you know, uh, message that you just gave, which is we all want to get back to live. Everybody wants to be in person. You know, virtual will probably be something that they can offer now for anybody who can't make it and they'll mm -hmm. be better at it and they'll have better conferences because of it. And if there's a guy they really, really, really want, you know, like Bill Maher's show, he brings in people on the screen sometimes. Yep. In, those, in the old days, he used to do that when he couldn't get them. And it works, you know, if it's not the entire conference, you know, and you bring in, you bring in like an amazing guy, like, you know, a celebrity who everybody's going to get excited about, beamed in from, you know, Dubai or wherever he may be, 
or she may be, it's, it's, it's cool, you know? And so I think there'll be a, a hybrid version. And exactly. I definitely think that everybody wants to get back to live. And, you know, I, I think that expanding and contracting and adapting is what it's all about. And that's what you, those are your words. I wrote them down. I remembered them. Expand, contract, adapt is what, yep. is what everybody has to do in, in, in this industry we're in, but, but in any industry right now. In, ex, and, expand on that. Expand on sure. those words. So it, for, uh, it is expand into possibility and then contract into execution. Uh -huh. and then and then repeat and so what a lot of us have been trained to do is to focus execute focus execute focus execute and that's mm -hmm. great it causes you know very lean six companies there's great operational efficiencies in when we focus execute but if we don't expand into possibility and then contract and focus and execute we, we lose a lot of options then we're, we're losing the forest for the trees and so it's a very intentional and purposeful technique of expanding into possibility contracting into executing and then figure then, then adapt and then move and adjust and then expand contract execute expand contract execute so that is a, a formula it's a very successful formula that we use you know with, with artists with executives with sales with service professionals with manufacturing just that whole process of igniting your mind like being a catalyst a trigger for your mind to open to expand and then again to contract and focus and execute and that's why i wrote the spark and the grind is because it's not you know a lot of artists or a lot of creative speakers will talk about that expansive vision the the mind opening uh wonderment of creativity it's fantastic, but that's not going to pay the bills. You've then got to figure out how to humanize that brand, that idea. You've got to be able to build trust, to be able to market, to be able to share, to scale. All mm -hmm. of those things can't be done when we're expanding. Those are all done in the contracting portion. So uh, in Hemingway, this, this was great. Um, I think he had a, a quote that was, um, write drunk, edit sober. Uh, so you know, for him, for him, it was right. He, he used so he used artificial substances by which to be able to expand his mind and just wander and but then when it no came artists to edit, have ever done that none it, it was only Hemingway and I bring him up tongue in cheek but uh, <laughs> for the for those who who like fun analogies um, you know that that would be one where it's you know right open edit closed and so it's, you the dividing up those processes into be able to create the the best possible outcome on the on the on the back end and you do that when you're painting. As well? I do that. I do that when I'm painting. I do that when I'm presenting. I do it. I do it even while live. So one of the reasons why I love live presenting so much is I'm adapting. Not every ten to twelve minutes. I'm adapting after everything that I say, how I say it. I'm watching and reading the audience. Oh, you know, wow. they're looking for. They're looking for more content. They want more data. They're not impressed with just that story. They want to go do the deep dive into how now competitively does that, uh, what does that mean for them now? Um, and so I, I will adjust content. I will shape content on the fly and I'll, I'll expand out into possibility and then contract into execution. When I'm writing my books, my blogs, my um, creating painting in my studio at home, step back, you know, take a look at the whole thing once again, and then back into, okay, I need to make, I need to round off that chin so that it sinks back into the face and looks more photorealistic. Then hmm. expand back out and then come back in and contract next. Ah, so it's yeah, a process great. that I'm using again and again and again. Musicians will do it. They'll lay down a track and then they'll sit back and they'll listen to it. Expand, expand, and then contract back in. Okay, you know, we need to hit this on the eighth note, on the eighth note, or, you know, pull this one out. And so there's a lot of uh, editing, there's a lot of contracting, there's a lot of uh, executing. All yeah. of those words are synonymous with productivity, but that productivity without creativity is, is not going to get you as far as when they're melded together as a, as a homogenous blend in, uh, in one soup. So how do you um, decide how, what guys or gals you're going to be painting? And you mostly paint people, right? When you're, doing, when you're doing the live events. 
I do, and, and for some specific reasons, is, is I'm, I'm painting as a hook for the audience. The person that I choose to paint for live performances is based on, on three core elements, and that is one, the demographic of the audience. And so I'm wanting to select uh, a person as well as music and video that they all can relate to. So this isn't meant to be a controversial or provocative painting. What I'm looking to do is find the common core, the element that we all have in connection so that this can lift and light them up. The second is the actual content of what I'm speaking about. If I'm going to be speaking about leadership, if I'm going to be speaking more on service, or if I'm going to be speaking more on adapting to change, that will change the nature of who I'm actually painting. And then the, the final one is just that relatability to where in the show. I, I would open with something much more energetic and fun, you know, like uh, the Rolling Stones or U2 or just generic to pull everyone in as a hook, to give them something that they haven't seen before, you know, to watch someone paint uh, Bono live in three minutes and 13 seconds is, is kind of a fun experience, but then I use that as the catalyst to jump into the actual content of the presentation. And in the conclusion of the show, I've, I've used this canvas. I've made a lot of different um, painting strokes or sketches on it to reinforce different take-homes that I want the audience to uh, hmm. refer to. And then at the dramatic conclusion of the presentation, the music comes back on and I complete the painting, but I complete it that the audience thinks it's all going logically one direction. But at the end of the show, I flip the painting upside down to reveal an entirely different portrait than what they were expecting. And I, I, that is that aha moment where all of our minds come together at one moment and realize that creativity the competitive advantage, the opportunity, all lies in that ability to see what everyone else sees logically, to see or anticipate the direction that we thought this image was gonna go, but then be able to twist it and to flip it upside down and to think like no one has ever thought before, to reveal a portrait of success that no one has ever achieved before. So there's a lot of heart issues and head issues and kind of environmental issues that I use in the painting and all of that goes into the selection of who I choose to paint that's going to ignite the content and ignite the audience to a new lay new level of, of uh, experience. Great um, and uh, I've seen that happen and it's <laughs> it's mind-blowing and, and it's gorgeous so and who, who are some of your favorite uh, guys and gals that you've painted over the years you just said you two Rolling Stone I mean you, how, how many people do you have is it just as, as simple as remembering what somebody looks like, or do you have like a hundred ready to go at any time that you can pull from? Yeah, I've, I've got probably 40 or 50 in my arsenal that I would use for various different reasons. If I'm in the you know, Northeast, I may uh, swing towards a Bruce Springsteen kind of figure. <laughs> Uh, if I'm you know, speaking in the, the Midwest or in the South, I might pull in a country figure. Uh, so it would be music that people would be able to identify with and relate to. Uh, so I do play off and customize there, but a, a lot of what I'm doing is it's rehearsal, rehearsal, rehearsal. So it takes me about three to six months to actually take an, an ideal image from um, photo into live performance painting uh, completed in three minutes. And so my first version takes me three hours, four hours to paint. And then I simplify it and extract out. And then I get it down and I do it again and again. Then I get it down to an hour and then 45 minutes and then 14 minutes and then simplify in so I can get it in three minutes or 13 seconds. You know, like John Lennon's Imagine. For me to paint Lennon in three minutes and 13 seconds because the short song. Uh, but it's an impactful song. It's a meaningful song. And to have that music playing, these images, and then the picture of John Lennon all of a sudden appear, it's, it's a... It's a magical moment that I love being able to create that um, takes the whole experience to a new level. I, I, I really enjoy it. Yeah, no, I, it's obvious that you do. And it's great because, you know, a lot of speakers, uh, I don't think enjoy speaking as much as, as you do because you're performing because, you, you, because you've got that real interaction with the audience that, that there's a lot of give back. There's a lot of uh, emotion in the air and a lot of the audience members are connecting with you maybe more so or more deeply uh, or more emotionally than they would with, with just somebody who's, who's speaking and saying amazing things, mm -hmm. but doesn't have that extra added element of entertainment that you have, which is so cool about you know, what you do. And I was also thinking to myself, have you got to meet any of the people you've ever painted 
And, and how did any, any cool stories there where you, you painted somebody and then all of a sudden you were with them in a room and they're like, I heard you paint me or how did that oh, go? Oh yeah. Well, and I've, I've had them following the painting. So I, you know, I performed with Magic Johnson. So he did the opening keynote. I did the closing keynote. I did a painting of him and then he signed the painting and then we gave it back to the audience as oh. a, a thank you. Nice. Um, you know, I've done that with Drew Brees. I've done that with Peyton Manning. I've done that with uh, you know, I, even a lot of Seth Godin, I've done it with Dan Pink. So I've even done it with other speakers where I've related it to the audience and then had them sign it. So I, I do bring other people in. Uh, uh, the painting that I most loved to do and the audience was went nuts for was this Tiger Wood painting that I did. You know, obviously prior to his uh, <laughs> poor behavior. Uh, so, you know, not only did his, his wife uh, suffer great loss there, he, Tiger suffered great loss. I suffered great loss. My audience has suffered great loss because I had to put him away. I had to put him in the timeout zone because uh, no, no longer painting him. You know, so I, I painted Michael Phelps for a while. So I, what I need is my, my celebrities to always behave well. Uh, so that, that, that would be my request. And it's, it's a hard one. A lot, a lot of people have some, some life that they live outside of their celebrity that uh, comes back to bite them. But yeah, I, I need my celebrities to, to behave well because they, I don't want anything that I paint to be controversial. Uh, I, I want it to be, I want it to be provocative to lure them in to, you know, to think about change, to think about Einstein and how he was this icon of both imaginative creativity and executable science, boom, merged together. There's Einstein. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Leadership. Mm -hmm service as well as confidence, humility as well as progress. Abraham Lincoln, there he is, let's go. So that's why I like to connect the actual um, image, the, the creator to the content that we're, we're talking about. And you painted the Mona Lisa on like a, a cornfield or something and then it was videotaped and photographed from a, a plane or a helicopter. Tell me, tell me about that project. Sure, that was a little over a, or about a decade ago, but wow. um, up in the the northern, uh, a little above you, Santa Maria area, we okay. carved into the desert a 10,000 foot uh, square foot Mona Lisa. So we had tractors and backhoes and cherry pickers and helicopters that would come up to give us perspective. And then I moved the earth around. So I would, you know, pull up rocks. We would pull in, you know, some grass for some shading, you know, around the the jawline we would push the eyes back you know using depth with bark so we created a 10,000 square foot Mona Lisa and then we kind of filmed the process and created a, a workbook out of it but for me that's just I, I had I couldn't do that one alone I had probably eight to ten other artists um, as well as family come and help operate the machinery uh, to give different perspectives and views but it was a collaborative effort so a lot with my larger uh, installation that did a, a three-story uh, Simone Biles after she captured the Olympic gold several years ago in a gymnastics room um, for young gymnasts, uh, young gymnasts. So was, uh, that was a, a large-scale painting uh, mural installation as well. But I like those bigger pieces because they're uh, they're collaborative. Do you have any new uh, things in the works, new guys or gals that you're learning or new big projects that you're dreaming of in the next uh, year or two? I, I do. I, I hold them safe in my incubator uh, before I, I release them because I, I don't want anyone to, uh, for me to not explain them as well as I'd like. Right. And so then they get prejudged early. So I'm in my creative incubator, I, I hold it in, in a very small uh, black box. I will tell you that, um, you know, even though books are going the way of the dinosaur, uh, I'm publishing a book this fall that is completely outside of all of my business work. It's a book about uh, spirituality, about race relations. It's just things that during this pandemic that um, have really come to the forefront for me. And I, I wanna get some of those ideas out there in kind of a collective body so that we can improve the dialogue of how we're addressing some of these uh, very contentious issues uh, so that we can be uh, more tolerant, more empathetic, more compassionate. Uh, so really, uh, something that I am excited about on a personal level, uh, but that's all I'm going to give you about it because okay. it's still it's still in my little precious incubator. Uh, I'm, but I'm I'm excited about we it. Yeah, we have a little bit of an exclusive announcement here, though a little bit of a tidbit of things to come, which I appreciate. A, a scoop. <laughs> a scoop. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you're you're the first. You're the first to know. <laughs> and uh, I I have a request. You know, I've got two four year old kids at home. You had such great advice at the top of this conversation about my kids. 
and I'm reading the most amazing kids books now. I mean, Jimmy Kimmel made an amazing kids book about the silly goose. I forget what it's called. I think it's the silly goose, mm -hmm. but uh, it's a very serious goose. Have you seen that book? I'm not, not yet, no. Uh, I mean, uh, he drew it and he wrote it. And, and it, it starts Dude. off with, the, the, this is the most serious goose you've ever met in your entire life. And you think you can make him laugh? Don't try and make him laugh. He does, he's very serious goose. And then obviously, and then in the middle of the book, there's this crazy, like a mirror made out of some crazy f material I've never seen. And you can look in it and see yourself and you can make silly faces. And that's the turning point in the book where he starts to crack a smile. And then by the end, he's a silly goose and the kids love it. So I'm well done, Jimmy Kimmel. Well yeah. done. <laughs> now, Jimmy, if you'd like to be on the show, let me know. Um, there it is. <laughs> well, but, so, so uh, you, with with your kids, as, as a father now, as, yeah. as a leader of your tribe, you're looking for ways to unlock your kids. How do you get them to be at their fullest potential? How do you get them to be responsible? Um, to do what you tell them, but to also be free and open. And that's why kids are such a great use of, of our skills as leaders and parents, because you want to draw these out of your kids yeah. so that you might be able to draw them out of employees or in your community later on. And so once you're a parent, you all of a sudden see the world from a whole new perspective. And yeah. you now know, these, this is what my boys get excited about. They don't get as excited about, you know, the, the things that I did, or they're not as excited about the Play-Doh, but man, do they love the crayons and do they love, you know, these other elements. And so um, as, as their leader, you're learning new ways to interact. And that's why Jimmy Kimmel probably wrote the book. He's like, you know what? My boys want something different. My kids respond to something different. I want right. to make that for them. Wouldn't it be great right. if, our, you know, if we could make a mirror inside a book where our kids make silly faces themselves and interact just brilliant stuff. So yeah, it's yeah. great to see the world around us. Well, I was getting at a point, which is like, are you going to write a kid's book? <laughs> I, I, your own illustrations. Cause a lot of what you talk about is, is, you know, going back to our childhood. I mean, something you also said that I never forgot. I heard this like 10 years from you ago from you. Do you know what it is? I'm about to say, you don't know. It might be crazy daddy time. No. Oh, but I want to hear what that is. Okay. <laughs> No, the fact that the crayon smell, mm -hmm. you, can, you can tell the story. It's, so the, the Crayola, not just crayon, but Crayola, oh. the brand Crayola is one of the top 20 most recognizable smells in the human experience. So that's, you know, with dill pickles, with peanut butter, coffee. It's one of those things that for whatever reason brings us back to our childhood that we remember so well. So just the smell of a crayon can reduce blood pressure in full grown adults downwards 10 points because of what it does to our psyche, our kind of nervous system, our parasympathetic nervous system that we connect to a time when it was less stressful, when things were easier. Yeah. Um, and so just that, you know, I, I tell you know, large groups to pull out your, your box of, pull out your box of crayons <laughs> and, 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 you know, take a drag. You had it right there, like. It, yeah, well, it, it was it was one for you know it was too far for a Zoom meeting's reach, but I, I went for it anyway. <laughs> but yeah, that that's one of those things that I I do I, I use a lot of those kind of connectors with the audience. Um, the one you've asked about crazy daddy time, I haven't done this in in a decade because my boys are grown now. But huh. uh, what I used to do is when when I talked about activating creativity, uh, is going back and and almost asking why more often so you know our kids ask why why is the sky blue why is water wet why and so we have to rethink these things so i i introduced audiences to crazy daddy time which is what i did with my boys where we would eat dinner backwards so we start with the dessert first and then we you know move towards the main course but it blows their mind because that's not how it is you know the way yeah. the way we eat is we have we have our salad we eat like a big boy and then if you eat everything then you can have access to dessert well you know once or twice every year i would call these crazy daddy time moments and we it would be the reverse dinner and we'd eat dinner backwards and they'd go nuts they would go nuts because they were so excited that they got to have crazy daddy time dinner where we started with the dessert first you know is it entirely healthy the, the, the jury's still out on that but <laughs> It, it made an impact on them in that moment and to this day that they remember for the rest of their lives. And so yeah. it's, activi it's activities like that, like- um, Looking at things differently, just turning the world upside down, not doing it the normal way, breaking some rules. 
and, and looking for those aha moments, looking for those moments of wow. How do we create moments of wow with our children? How do we create moments of wow with our spouses? How do we create moments of wow with our customers? And so your kids are a great little uh, vehicle by which to be able to explore some of those wow moments and then translate them out into bigger areas. What can we do that maybe it's not perfect, but that it's remarkable and no one's ever done it like this before. And it kind of takes the hard work out of this is hard work to solve this problem or to connect with these people who are difficult or I've done the same thing for years. How do I change it? It's going to be hard to figure that out. But, but it makes hard work kind of fun and easy and it opens up this new channel of now, like you said, creativity where you're doing something fun and it's creative at the same time. So that's genius. Well, and to, to pull it back into kind of the, the mindset that we go into this with, when things are difficult, they cause us anxiety and pressure, and I don't know if I can do that. Again, we're operating in, in a mode of scarcity. When we get over into gratitude and abundance and empathy and compassion, what it does is it unlocks curiosity in us as adults, where we're looking to then how how can we master complexity? You know, how can I figure out this new social, mobile, and cloud world? How am I going to figure out what this new Zoom, you know, meetings are going to look like? Well, we've got to be curious. Um, and so, any lack of creativity in adults is just simply a lack of curiosity. It's a lack of exploration, a lack of accepting what is now around us in the situation that it is and being excited about it. And with the same curiosity that we want to figure out how to walk, the same curiosity that we want to figure out how to talk, that we learned math, that same curiosity that drove us as kids, we can access as adults to try and figure out Snapchat, to try and figure out TikTok, to try and figure out Zoom meetings and interaction where we can, you know, have the same feeling of a live venue, but that we don't have to get on a plane and potentially expose ourselves to harmful diseases. So we're all looking for this, but I think curiosity and abundant mindset is going to be how we're, how we're going to unlock it. Not, oh, you know, I wish things were like the good old days. I wish we could just have live meetings again, and I'm just going to keep my fingers crossed that it returns to the way it's going to be. It might, and then great, we've already got that taken care of. But if it doesn't, man, we've got to operate on that razor's edge and to be curious about the future and what technology and what artificial intelligence and facial recognition and autonomous driving is going to look like in the future so that we can interact with it and not become obsoleted by it. Absolutely. Amazing. And, and, and I think that with people like you out there spreading these kind of messages and reminding people about you know, different ways of thinking and looking at things and, and reminding people about really kind of how easy it is to be innovative and disruptive and creative. We're, we're, we're in good hands. And I, and I think that, uh, uh, you know, during this COVID crisis that we're in right now, I think that we don't realize that, and we need to remember, and I think hopefully you'll agree with me because I know you're the eternal optimist and I, and I am as well. Um, but, uh, you know, that like a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, with our grandkids from now, we'll be able to look back and say, you know, that was a tough time. It was a horrible time for a lot of people. It was, it was a really out of the left field and it really hit us hard and it was awful for a lot of reasons. But because it happened, this never would have happened for me or for our society or for our country or for our mindset. In other words, you know, if it wasn't for COVID, you know, we wouldn't have innovated. We wouldn't have looked at ourselves in the mirror. We wouldn't have done something new, started a new company, done something that we had to do to save our company. You know, whatever it was that we did as innovators mm -hmm. was because we were forced to. And so I think that a lot of people are going to hopefully say that uh, the best thing in their life that they're now living in five years from now or one year from now or 10 started right now in 2020. The, the roaring 2020s we'll be talking about for the rest of our lives. Our grandkids are going to know about what happened during this global pandemic. And we'll be talking when we're out to dinners in the future, when we're at cocktail receptions. We'll always have our story, what we did over the time of the COVID crisis during the shelter in. And 
for me, I realized that very early on. So with my family, my boys, we hunkered down. And even though it was very difficult and so many of our lifelines were taken away from us, we wanted to make this time one that we were always going to remember, not because it was easy, not because it was fun, but that it would be memorable, that yeah. we did something of significance. For us, we bonded as a family um, and it was incredible incredibly significant where they're going to do things with probably their children in the future because of how we bonded as a family. It was, it was truly remarkable for us, maybe because I'm optimistic, maybe because I realized that um, looking back, this is going to be something we're always going to be talking about with clients, with uh, friends, family. So we need to do everything we can to make this memorable. And so that's how we've kind of lived our time here. And we're not out of it yet. So there's still things that we can be doing to be memorable. So that's just my, my go-to each day is how can I continue lighting up my family, continue um, activating ideas in a different incubator than I had in the past. And so it's a um, same hamsters running around in the mind, but different access and how we're, how we're shipping it out. And so, um, any um, any any real quick uh, uh, hints or, or ideas that you guys uh, use to succeed to bond and to have that you know family kind of moment that you were talking about? Was there anything specifically that you that you decided you were going to do that was was something that you were really happy with? Several. Um, one is we started exercising as a family. Uh, and so my middle son, Julian, would lead workouts, CrossFit workouts that were really, really tough for an old man like myself to com uh, complete. But that was, you know, every, every day we would have some kind of workout activity. Um, so that was measured into every day. Uh, every morning, my, my wife, Tasha, and I, we will write. Um, and so we've spent this entire time. I mean, we've been married now for uh, 25 years. Both of us are turning 50 years old this year. And so during COVID, thank you. What we did during COVID was this is where the two of us were co-writing this book together. And we took time, you know, from until noon each day, we would quietly be with our coffee, both sitting at our writing stations and we would be writing and then riffing ideas off with each other. And so we, we use this as a space to bond and to create, uh, you know, a lot of times people write books, they talk about it's like giving birth to a child. For this, we are wanting to give birth to this this idea of what marriage has been like for us, what spirituality has been, what parenting has been. So for us, it was a bonding element for my wife and I to use to be able to create something and to think and reflect how we can make something better and more special that we'll have for the rest of our lives. I mean, this will be published you know, later on this year, but we're just excited about being able to, to do that together. That's amazing, Eric. Wow. Well, you are such an inspiration to all. You are so creative and such a, a master, you know, artist and, and uh, such an inspiration. Just looking at a painting, you can, you can see the life and you can almost, almost see the messaging you, you went through earlier about how kind of you pick the paintings. And that's, that's so awesome. So I, I look forward to seeing you present again in person because it's something you never want to miss. And, uh, and again, thank you so much for joining me today. And God bless you and your family down there in San Diego. Thank you, Chris, to you and your boys and your wife and all of your wonderful customers and clients. Thanks for taking the time. It was an honor to share with you. And I look forward to uh, meeting all of you personally at some point uh, later on in the future when we return to live shows. Absolutely. It'll be fun. All right. Take care and uh, have a really good rest of the week. Rock on. Thank you very much, Chris. All right. Take Cheers. care. Bye.